Okay, um, good afternoon, and let's begin. So, I, before we start, I'd again like to thank the Atkinson Center and the Department of Biological Environmental Engineering for the sponsorship. And today I have the um, pleasure to introduce Robert Kopp from University of Rucker, from Rutgers University. And as you can see, um, he is remote, luckily. Um, I think if he drove up here, it probably would have been pretty hard to get back to get back home. So um, Bob's research focus is on understanding uncertainty in the future in future climate change with emphasis on sea level change and the interactions between physical climate change and the economy and the use of climate risk information to for decision making. It's involved in many activities involving climate. Um, he's co-director of the University of Office of Climate Action at Rutgers. He directs a megalopolitan coastal transformation hub, which is a consortium meant to facilitate flexible, equitable, and robust multi-decadal planning to manage climate risk and advance scientific understanding and how interactions among coastal climate hazards, changing landforms, and human decisions shape climate risk. He's also um, one of the directors of, multi of the Climate Impact Lab. He's, a, he's been the lead author on the IPC6 assessment report, the fourth national climate change assessment report, and on the economic risks of climate change and American perspective. And in particular, I was intrigued about one of his articles on usable climate change. Um, there are many scientists who are involved in looking at climate change theoretically, understanding climate within the Earth system. And the question is, how does one make that research usable? What's the relation between sort of theoretical science and science for science sake and usable science? And usable science might be a science directed towards decision maker, decision making or contribute to social societal welfare in a direct and causally discernible way. So let's welcome Bob, and thank you so much for coming in and talking to us. Great, thank you, thank you, Peter, and uh, thank you, everyone. Um, so, as Peter indicated, uh, this is going to be a bit of a meta scientific um, talk. Uh, I also occasionally do science, but I seem to spend a lot of time uh, the last few years as an administrator uh, thinking about how to do science. Uh, better in a way uh, that um, can inform decisions more effectively. Um, and in particular, um, Peter asked me to talk on some of the work we've done about how universities and higher, ed higher education can uh, bring scientific knowledge to bear uh, with respect to, to climate action. Um, so I'm gonna focus on that and then draw particularly heavily on some work I've done on land grant universities and the land grant experience and how we can what we can learn from that about <laughs> uh, universities to, to better tackle the climate crisis. Uh, so I just want to begin uh, by acknowledging this work is sort of a synthesis of a lot of different stuff I've done over a lot of different times. Um, it has many uh, parents, uh, both intellectual and financial. Um, a lot of the workers. I'm talking about relates to stuff that's uh, been done, funded by NASA or NSF, um, particularly as part of the NSF Coastlines and People Program, uh, as well as work in the Climate Impact Lab and, and other sources. Um, and as I mentioned, um, I'm drawing heavily in much of the framing of this talk on um, an article I wrote a couple of years ago, which uh, you can see over there on the left if you want to grab the citation um, called Land Grant Lessons for Anthropocene Universities. Um, and then there's sort of a, a op-ed uh, version associated with that that came out in EOS, um, the Journal of the American, the, the newsletter of the American Geophysical Union um, around the same time. And so I sent Peter the slides. You can grab the references there if you don't grab them now. So I'm gonna talk uh, today about the climate crisis and uh, I use that term as opposed to either climate change or, or climate emergency uh, deliberately. Um, so I thought I might begin by talking about the term crisis. 
uh, which if you just look at the dictionary definition, um, is defined as a time of intense difficulty or danger when a difficult or important decision must be made. Um, and the uh, origin uh, ultimately is from the medical term crisis in Greek, um, or medical Latin derived from the Greek crisis, uh, where, where it turns to the sort of the critical point in a disease, particularly with respect to a fever, uh, and whether or not a, a fever breaks, and if so, how. Um, and I think that all of those language sort of nicely summarize where we are, right? We are, we are at a time of crisis with respect to the global climate, where, you know, we can either act decisively to limit uh, the amount of further warming and, and the potential risk we face, or, or not, and, and face escalating uh, risk at what has been a, an increasing rate. Um, the climate crisis is also, in my mind, sort of intimately bound up with other societal crises we are facing right now. Right? We are still uh, recovering from a global public health crisis uh, that in any ways acts in a more rapid fashion on many of the same stressors that climate change acts on. Uh, you know, we saw with the pandemic how the external force of the virus played into structures of, of societal inequality uh, and lead, led to unequal impacts in a way that climate change does also. Uh, we saw, you know, over the last few years, how the pandemic and uh, slightly longer term trends are leading to a crisis of global democracy, uh, as well as a crisis of inequality. And all of these are coming together. And, and I would argue that, you know, you cannot talk about solutions to climate change in isolation, right? Climate change and, cli and climate crisis touches all of our political system and all of our economic system. Um, and so you cannot think about solutions to the climate crisis uh, in isolation from solutions to sort of broader questions of governance. Um, so one additional framing that's kind of helpful in thinking about this, uh, which many of you have probably encountered before, is the framing of the Anthropocene. Uh, it's a term that's come into increasing use over the last two decades uh, to denote the present geological instance in time, where, where present is still under debate, uh, whether that's uh, 12,000 years or 50 years or, or somewhere in between, um, but a period of intensifying human impact on the climate um, and this sort of schematic diagram uh, sort of illustrates um, that escalating impact. Uh, so here we're looking at time on a log scale in some schematic illustration of, of human influence on a non-linear scale, starting with the emergence of our species and fire and meat eating. Um, you know, at, at some point in this period, our population as a species was down to a few dozen, uh, but then we rebounded and had a significant role to play in extinctions of large megafauna uh, in most of the world's continents, um, the spread of farming, uh, the globalization associated with European imperialism um, in the, in the middle, middle of the last millennium. Uh, and then particularly in the period since World War II, uh, very rapid growth and a lot of different impacts on the planet associated with exponential growth uh, in population and the size of the economy and our ability to tap our planet's natural resources. Um, and so the crisis has illustrated here is the question of, well, what sort of um, world are we creating? Is it one in which we stabilize the climate and stabilize the way in which we use our natural resources so that we can be in a, a steady state? Is it one that continues on a course of, sort of escalating and unequal impacts and irreversible losses to the biosphere or somewhere in between? Right. So that is the crisis. Um, and as many people have said, we're sort of in a critical time period, right? We're, we uh, you know, 
we will start to see over the next 20 to 30 years, the effects of how the world goes in terms of greenhouse gas emissions over the next decade. Um, and we, the differences between that world where we get to net zero and stop increasing the planetary thermostat and ones in which we continue emitting um, will become increasingly stark and increasingly um, pose increasingly large risks. So from a scientific perspective, um, the perspective, you know, we've talked about usable science. Um, I would argue that sort of tackling climate change and other planetary scale Anthropocene challenges like biodiversity requires what we call a transdisciplinary Earth systems approach. Um, so let me let's break that down. So when we talk about Earth systems approach, what we mean um, is that you know there are different parts of the Earth system as a whole, the atmosphere, the oceans, uh, the cryosphere, the ice on, on land, um, the, the solid Earth, and human systems as part of that. So energy systems, the economy, um, human institutions. Uh, and these all interact. You cannot meaningfully assess the fate of the climate with a purely atmospheric perspective or a purely ocean perspective or a purely natural systems perspective, right? You need to understand how these systems interact to meaningfully assess the likely outcomes of different policies uh, and to help inform uh, the risks that we have to manage. Um, so that's air system. So what does it mean? What do we mean by transdisciplinary, right? So you've probably heard of multidisciplinary. That's where you take multiple disciplines uh, on a common and get them to look at a couple of themes. Take interdisciplinary, right? So that's where the scientists come together, researchers come together um, to contribute different perspectives uh, on a topic um, around a common and, and uh, research program. Um, and then there's transdisciplinary. What, what distinguishes transdisciplinary research is that the point of integration is a problem that is owned by actors in the real world. Um, right? And so it's illustrated here by this figure. Um, and this was a, this is also what's called uh, convergence research and uh, you know with the language now favored by um, all the funding agencies. But the idea with transdisciplinary research is that you start with a problem, right? So it could be um, how does, uh, coastal New Jersey uh, make itself more resilient uh, to climate change. And that is a problem that is owned by several actors in the real world, right? By households living on the coast, by the municipalities on the coast, by state government, by the US Army Corps, by FEMA, right? And so there's problems that are real world problems with real world actors. And then you need to draw in the different scientific perspectives around that problem. So the problem serves has what we sometimes call a boundary object, something that you know people with different perspectives, whether that's you know general public, policymakers, um, home builders, or researchers, can come together with their own different perspectives and look at this common boundary object, this common problem, um, in a way that helps shape the research, and the research can help inform the decisions around the, this problem. So, so this sort of transdisciplinary research is not the sort of research that our traditional academic departments are set up to do. It inherently draws upon many of those. Um, and so thinking about how to make sure we do this research and do this well really is an important problem in sort of higher ed policy and design. And I'm going to argue that there's a lot that can be learned about this. Uh, from the history of the land grant system, um, which Cornell is, is part of, has his, has his records. Um, and in particular, I'm going to argue that the land grant system has been doing this very effectively in the area of agricultural and rural economic development for the last century plus, and, and talk about why and what we can draw upon uh, from that experience to help make universities and academia better prepared um, to deal with effects deal with and societal reactions to climate crisis. So this is a map um, of the land grant system. Uh, you'll notice that there is at least one land grant uh, college or university in, in every state and territory. Um, 
there are actually three different categories of land grants. So there's the 1862 land grants. Um, so Cornell is one of those, Rutgers is one of those, um, that date their establishment back to the Marill Act of 1862, uh, which gave uh, rights to sell public land to universities in each state in order to fund the establishment of colleges focused on agriculture and engineering. There are the 1890 land grants, uh, which are historically black uh, colleges and universities that were founded um, during, you know, so so after, so land grant system came in during the, the period where the Republicans and uh, Abraham Lincoln's party of, of Republicans sort of had uh, unequivocal control over Congress because the South had seceded. Um, there's a period, uh, you know, again, part of the, part of the Reconstruction program. In many ways, um, there was a period, sort of, at the end of Reconstruction, where the Republicans uh, lost control of Congress, um, and then there is a period in the late 1880s uh, when Republicans came back in and they did things like admit admit to the uh, Union a bunch of states that were Republican leaning uh, to help. Uh, cement their, their position a little bit. Um, and in part of that, uh, they looked at what was going on with the land grants colleges in the South and saw they were headed in the direction of not admitting um, uh, Black people. Um, and so they created the 1890 uh, land grants as historically Black uh, universities to be, to be part of the um, same system. And then 1994 land grants are um, tribal colleges and universities that were made part of the land grant system um, in 1994. So what makes a land-grant university? What is distinctive about the land-grant model? Right. So the land-grant model sort of rests on a tripod of three pillars. So the first pillar is instruction, um, and that, that is carried by the agricultural colleges established by the Morrill Acts of 1862 and 1890. And the charge of these land-grant colleges is, in, in the words of the Morrill Act, um, to teach such branches of learning as are related to agriculture and the mechanic arts, the agriculture and engineering, in such a manner as the legislators of the states may prescribe in order to promote both the liberal and practical education of the industrial classes and their pursuits and professions. Um, so one thing to note there, right, the focus is on agriculture and engineering, but not just on practical education, also on liberal education, and an important element of this is in the manner that the legislatures of the states prescribe, right? So the Morrill Act gives this, has the, basically it tells the states to designate a recipient for these rights to public land uh, that will be sold um, uh, uh, to, to fund it. So, right, so in, in, in New Jersey, uh, you know, there was a political struggle between Rutgers and Princeton uh, as to who would become the recipient of those grants, and, and uh, um, Rutgers got it, and this now you know became the land grant college. Um, the second pillar are the experiment stations, which were created by the Hatch Act of 1887, like the land grant colleges created in every state uh, to do use-inspired research, including what we would now call transdisciplinary research, right? That the charge in the Hatch Act to the experiment stations is to aid in inquiring and diffusing useful and practical information on subjects connected with agriculture and to promote scientific investigation and experiments respecting agriculture. So instruction, use-inspired research, and then the third, uh, the, the, the third pillar is cooperative extension, right, which was set up by the Smith Lever Act of 1914, has a partnership between the land grant university, the federal government, the state, and the county. Right? And it's called cooperative because of the role of those four parties, all of whom chip into the funding of extension. And the purpose of extension has set forth in um, the Smith Lever Act is to aid in diffusing useful and practical information on subjects related to agriculture and home economics and to encourage the application of the same. So what I would argue is distinctive about the land-grant tripod as opposed to, you know, if you go to um, 
almost any university, right? What is it? What are the purposes of the university, right? Instruction, research, and service. What's distinctive about this tripod is that the research and service, we call extension, are externally focused and focused on sort of engaging the general public in this, right? So I'll get to get to more in a second, but it, it's a there's this external focus, this idea of bridging boundaries that is built into the structure of the land grant tribal that makes it distinct from just a generic university, makes it distinct from, you know, if you go back to Harvard and Yale in the in the 17th century in the colonial colleges, they might have said they also had instruction and service as part of their mission, but service in the case of those universities at the colleges at the time is really like preaching the word of God to the, the masses, right? So the different sense of service. So what is land grant? Um, if that's the sort of formal structure, what, what are the stories we tell about land grant? And so I'm gonna define sort of three different narratives that people tell, in some cases, the same people tell um, about land grant um, and point to the one that I think we have the most to learn from. So some of what's told uh, about land grant um, is what we might call a technocratic or heroic narrative, um, sort of an updating of the sort of old, uh, you know, religious college, Harvard, Yale type model of service being sort of bringing the light of knowledge to, to the masses. Um, so this is a quote from the founding dean of your college of agriculture, Liberty Hyde Bailey, um, who was a very important figure in their cooperative extension and its establishment, right, which views the role of College of Agriculture, not in terms of agriculture per se, but in terms of what he calls rural civilization, right, to direct and aid in the development of the entire world civilization. Um, which is a, a very uh, sort of self-important uh, way of looking at the, the role of, of the co agricultural college and, and extension. Um, and, and you can see, I think probably fairly straightforwardly, the connection between that mission and sort of the, the evangelical um, role of the more the earlier theological colleges. The second narrative um, sort of highlights the problems with that approach. Um, and, and points to, right, this period in the, the 1860s and in, in the land grant was stated was a period of state growth in the U.S. Uh, for many reasons, but one of these was associated with sort of centralization and industrialization. Uh, and some have critiqued the land grant colleges as part of that as being part of this mission of centralization and diminishing the autonomy of the individual farmers and their communities. Um, a second critique in this theme sort of says, well, points the finger at land grant universities, but also universities more generally said, well, maybe at one point you had uh, a big focus on public service has your service mission. But, but if you look at some of the practical work that goes on in the university today, a lot of it is less public service and more consulting. Um, and I'm going to say, yes, both public service and consulting are valuable from a scholarship perspective by providing sort of a real world test, a real world grounding of, you know, is this researcher doing useful? Um, but, uh, you know, in consulting, the benefits pro the private to private people and the public in, in, in public service, the benefits flow to, to the Commonwealth of which the, you know, which has created the university. Um, so it's a second sort of populist critique of really this is, land grant and higher ed more broadly. And then the third sort of populist critique uh, points out the fact uh, that uh, you know, land grants are founded on grants of stolen land, um, that you know, Rutgers and Cornell and our peer institutions got grants of expropriated indigenous land uh, in the US. And, and there was a project maybe four or five years ago now by High County News uh, that went and traced and said, okay, well, whose land was it uh, that was taken? Um, and so when we talk about land grant, particularly the 1862 land grants, um, and we also have to acknowledge um, this, this debt. Um, but that brings us to the, the third uh, counter-narrative, -narr which is the one I want to focus on, um, 
which I think is, is at the core of what we can learn from looking at that land grant tripod, um, right? which is that the role of universities and particularly the role of extension is, is a role not of you know, shedding light onto the masses, but of bringing people together has part of a, a, a catalyst of democracy. Um, all right, so, so here's Liberty Hyde Bailey again a few years later, right? It's not sufficient to train technically in the trades and crafts and arts with the goal of greater economic efficiency, right? This can be accomplished in a despotism and result in no self-action on the part of the people. Every democracy must reach far beyond what is commonly known as economic efficiency and do everything it can to enable those in the backgrounds to maintain their standing and their pride and to partake in the making of political affairs, right? So land grants through accessible education, through useful research and through particularly cooperative extension, empowering people to act as citizens. Um, a important report that came out uh, in 1930, her states this very clearly. Um, right, there is a new leave-in at work in rural America. You know, and today we we probably tend to use the word catalyst uh, rather than uh, leaven, uh, but that, that's why that means the same thing in this context. Right, is stimulating better endeavor in farming and homemaking, bringing rural people together in groups for social intercourse and study, for solving community and neighborhood problems and fostering better relations and common endeavor, right? And that bit, the idea that the co that agricultural colleges and cooperative extension serve the purpose of bringing people together to solve common problems and foster better relations, I think is core to why this model has a lot to tell us about how to manage uh, climate risk. Right, because the core of transdisciplinary research and the and its application requires bringing people who are dealing with that problems, who have actual decisions to make, together with people who have the ability to help study those, to find common solutions. And universities, land grant universities, and otherwise, are quite potent in this role as conveners because we are inherently scale crossing institutions, right? What does that, what do I mean by that? Well, we are institutions that have deep roots in our local communities, right? So Rutgers has deep roots in New Brunswick, Newark, Camden, and New Jersey more broadly. Um, Cornell is, has deep roots in, in Ithaca and, and upstate New York. Um, but we are also institutions that are networked together, networked together, um, with our peers uh, through networks of universities, land grant universities, Big Ten, et cetera, um, and also network together through the networks that our faculty and researchers belong to, right? So we have researchers at our institutions, right, who are plugged in internationally to things like the Inter-Africanal Panel on Climate Change, the International Panel on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services, um, National Academies, and so forth, right? So we are deeply rooted in place but connecting outward around the world. And then we're also inherently crossing timescales, right? So, you know, we have faculty who are in their 70s and students who are in their teens and we see each other every day. And that role as institutions that are, can bring people together, connect local problems to global networks of knowledge and, have both one eye on the problems of today and one eye on the next generation, that is exactly the sort of convening and mindset we need to deal with sort of the problems of the Anthropocene and problems like climate change. So in the next part of my talk, I wanna briefly tell you um, a few things we are doing at Rutgers that um, sort of align with this vision. Uh, so the first uh, is very much aligned uh, with this vision, which is as a transdisciplinary research and education intended to inform climate decision-making uh, in the Mid-Atlantic region. And the second, I wanna tell you a little bit about sort of at a, at a broader level, our university climate strategy um, and how and where we see that going. Um, so let's first start by 
the set of projects um, that are really trying to broaden the Rutgers land grant mission uh, to take in um, climate action more broadly. So, so let me start by defining the term climate services. Uh, so climate services, uh, well, let's give a couple, a couple of examples. So climate services, often something talked about particularly in the adaptation context, but also relevant in a mitigation context. Um, start with the point that adaptation and I would argue community mitigation decision-making are continuing risk management processes with no endpoint. Right? So you need, in order to adapt, in order to guide communities in how we get to net zero, we need to bring together individuals and organizations of all types to assess risks and vulnerabilities, take actions to reduce those risks, and learn over time. Um, and that requires both input of knowledge into that process and a feedback of learning about how well it's doing and, look, and feeding back into the local network of knowledge and the global network of knowledge. And climate services, as defined by the World Meteorological Organization, are, are organizations that provide climate information in a way that assists decision making by those individuals and organizations. And that services are not, you can't, you can't do climate services with a, a phone app, right? Services require appropriate engagement with an effective access mechanism and are responsive to user needs, right? So climate services, you know, partially about information sources, but a lot of it is about the people, right? The people who take knowledge sources and make them salient and uh, relevant, you know, so make them salient to decision contexts that people hold and part in this role has extension of bringing people together. Um, so a few things we're doing in records in this space. Uh, so one, about seven years ago, we set up a graduate certificate program in coastal climate risk and resilience which takes students uh, from a variety of different backgrounds. Uh, so, so oceanographers, um, ecologists, climate scientists, urban planners, policy uh, students, um, civil engineers, landscape architects, and teaches them one, how to work together with one another. So how to develop a common language, thinking about the coasts and the climate as a, as a system uh, about human and natural processes. Two, teaching them how to hold productive dialogues uh, with decision makers and other stakeholders who have problems associated with the coastal system. And three, um, putting them in uh, studio courses where they actually are working with uh, coastal stakeholders uh, to help them, say, develop a, a resilience plan. So we've um, so, so yes, this is a, this is sort of a summary of what I, I just said, but it's sort of a discipline plus approach. So students take the, the certificate on top of a master's or PhD level program, uh, and then they go through this, this series of courses. So transdisciplinary perspectives where you learn systems thinking and team science, communicating science with decision makers, um, urban planning studio course where you're working with a stakeholder. So, so this semester, um, students are working uh, with the Middle Lands Authority. Um, and then an elective also. So if you're a natural scientist, for instance, taking a course in, in policy or engineering. Uh, and our alumni in, the, in this program have gone on to climate-related positions in the private sector, um, particularly sort of environmental consulting and engineering firms um, in the public sector. Um, we've had multiple students who go on to win congressional fellowships and, and serve on the Hill. Um, social sector, so people involved in, in leadership positions of the Nature Conservancy and Sustainable Just Jersey, um, as, well as, as well as in academia. So that's one element. And actually, one of the things uh, a bunch of those students to go on to do before they graduate is to work with a climate services organization based at Rutgers called the New Jersey Climate Change Resource Center, uh, which uh, has a, a climate resilience core of graduate students who help stakeholders, you know, who have gone through, got in this sort of professional uh, 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 development and are now helping with a variety of problems with the state government and, and communities. So the New Jersey Climate Change Resource Center was created in 2020 by state law, by the legislature, with the mission of creating and supporting the use of impartial and actionable science to advance government, public, private and non-governmental sector efforts to adapt to and mitigate a changing climate. 
And I think one of the core rationales for doing this, right, is the recognition that um, you cannot do the sort of science we're talking about without professionals, without professionals who are in charge of bringing people together to solve, to solve problems. Uh, that is not something I, as a research and teaching faculty, uh, am trained to do. And it's not something really that can be done on a moonlighting basis. It's really a full-time job, right? To do this well, to solve problems, you need a research structure where there are trained people, like our graduates of our C2R2 program, who are um, who, who are in the convening role, who are in the relationship manage role, who are in the role of translating between scientists and stakeholders. Um, and that's a function the New Jersey Climate Change Resource Center serves, right? It draws upon not just Rutgers, but the entire higher education sector of the state to bring people together with stakeholders to solve problems and provide information in a form that's relevant um, and understandable. Uh, so this is just a portfolio of some of what the Climate Change Resource Center has done. Right? So it's done reports uh, for various clients um, around things like, well, how would we develop a statewide ocean acidification monitoring network? Um, how would we consider ecosystem services valuation uh, in, in New Jersey agriculture? Um, what are the sea level rise uh, projections we might want to use as we're designing state regulations? Um, they've done best practice documents for public health and for local planners and for watershed managers, and they've created tools. And so, you know, I said tools alone, web tools alone are not a sufficient way of delivering climate services, but combined with the capacity, the human capacity um, to do this, it can be quite useful. So we have a bunch of tools like NJ Flood Mapper um, and NJ Hazadep that allow planners to go in, look locally, draw upon data sources and, and see what projections are for risk they might have to manage. Um, and as I said, one of the things that Climate Change Resource Center does um, is sort of take our graduate students while they're still graduate students and give them professional experience. Uh, so this is our the current members of our climate core. Um, so many of them are C2R2 alums or you know many of the rest are, are um, who are not C2R2 alums are urban planning students of, of some sort. Um, and they've done things like help Trenton uh, develop a resilience plan, um, work on a coastal vulnerabilities assessment with Wildhood uh, and Bradley Bleach and, Hi and Highland Park, which is a community I live in, um, investigated uh, the distribution of energy costs in New Jersey, um, looked at issues related to historic preservation and flood risk. Um, and so these are these are professional activities that students are doing while they are still um, graduate students at Rutgers. So the New Jersey Climate Change Resource Center and its staff of boundary workers, of climate, you know, people we call climate translators, uh, the, the professionals who know how to talk to scientists and know how to talk to stakeholders are critical players um, in this large NSF uh, funded uh, hub uh, that I direct, the Megalopolitan Coastal Transformation Hub. Um, and our goal in MOC is to bring communities, decision makers, stakeholders, and researchers together in communities across the New York City, New Jersey, Philadelphia region with three goals. Um, one is to advance the science, uh, particularly the science of how climate hazards and land farms and human decisions interact to shape climate risk. The second is to be useful, specifically to facilitate flexible, equitable, and robust long-term planning to manage climate risk. And the third is to learn how to do useful science better. Um, so build a partnership uh, between academics and stakeholders that provides insights for just, equitable, and inclusive climate action in diverse coastal urban mega regions like our own um, around the world. So we have 13 institutions involved in MOC. Um, our researchers include climate and sea level scientists like me, um, climate communications and engagement specialists like those at the um, Climate Change Resource Center, civil engineers, urban planners, anthropologists, decision analysts, economists, emergency managers, ethicists, and public policy scholars. Um, and one of the challenges with such a diverse team is how to make sure we actually effectively 
bring the whole team together and solve a problem together in a way that goes beyond what we can do individually, right? That's the core of actually doing transdisciplinary research, right? If we are all just taking our own isolated takes on the problem, it'll, it can be somewhat useful, uh, but it's not going to get at the interactions among the different parts of the problem, and it's not what we would call transdisciplinary. It might be interdisciplinary. If people really are doing a poor job talking to one another, it might be multidisciplinary. Um, but what we are aiming to do is bring people together around a common problem, transdisciplinary research. And our um, common framework that we are trying uh, uh, to, to bring people together around is derived from a framework called Dynamic Adaptive Policy Pathways, or DAP, um, which is basically a framework for saying, okay, well, there are certain things we can assess probabilities of in the climate system, but there are also certain things uh, that are deep uncertainties Yet none that we can't put probabilities on, but nonetheless, we have to manage. And so what we want to know is what is the space of plausible futures we're, we're facing? What are the actions we might take to manage risks in those futures? And when will we know what conditions will tell us when we have to switch from one strategy to another, right? So dynamic adaptive policy pathways are really about contingency plannings for responding to climate risk across the space of possible futures, right? So in this sort of schematic diagram from Falmouth, Massachusetts, the problem is how do we manage flood risk in this area surf drive? And our strategies could be building, you know, building a new bridge, improving maintenance, ending road maintenance, uh, beach and dune restoration, removing parts of the roads, building seawalls, so forth, right? And these fall into sort of broad categories of protecting uh, this area, uh, trying to do nature-based approaches, uh, doing a managed retreat uh, from the area, um, or trying to improve connectivity between the area um, and the rest of the town. Uh, and the question is basically, how do you decide how to choose among these different options, uh, given that you can't just look at the physical climate in isolation? The decisions you make to manage risks uh, will affect you know, what people are exposed to, but it also will affect how people behave. And you have to understand the uh, consequences of different decisions for what households are going to do, how that will affect municipal finances, uh, how that will affect say, property and insurance markets. And you need to understand all of that in order to really do the trade-off analysis among the in different pathways before you and know when it makes sense to switch between strategies. Um, so I'm going to skip over that. Uh, and just um, sort of find, like, again, this requires a lot of different research areas that have to come together. Um, and this sort of is, is sort of our portfolio of different elements uh, that we bring to bear when we are working on um, a problem. For instance, uh, one of the problems we're working on now has to do with um, the, equi the, the trade off between equity and efficiency in um, flood adaptation in, in Philadelphia. So, right, so we have to think about flood hazards. We have to think about compound events, right? So flood hazards are one thing, but what about um, you know, a flooding associated with a hurricane uh, that also happens to cause a blackout and is followed by a heat wave, right? Those sorts of compound events can have impacts on human resilience that go beyond, well, a that of, say, a flood, then two weeks later, a blackout, and then two weeks later, a heat wave. We have to understand the hazard. We have to understand who and what is exposed and vulnerable to this hazard. So exposure and vulnerability includes um, both where people are and where buildings are and what state those people and buildings are in. We have to understand sort of what's, what's at stake here, right? And this, what's at stake is something that is really owned by the stakeholders, not the researchers. And so our goal, um, and this is why we have a lot of social scientists as well as philosophers on the team is to understand, okay, for the residents in a community, what are their perceptions of risk? What do they value? What are they concerned about? What about the local governments? Um, what about community organizations? And what insights 
can be brought to bear on the particular area we're working on from experts in our area more broadly. And then we think about things like municipal finance, housing and insurance markets, and how national and state policy affect the interactions among these. And then the goal is to bring these different perspectives in an integrated framework that allows us to look um, more rigorously and at, at well, what are the consequences of different policy you know, of, of different strategies a municipal government, for example, might deploy, or um, a of different um, funding policies FEMA might adopt, and how might those pay out given the feedbacks among all of these elements. Um, so we're still in a pretty early stage. Uh, uh, so the integration is very much a work in progress, but this is just an example of some of uh, the, the products we've produced so far. So we've had you know, papers looking at uh, what past coastal flood defense projects can tell us about the political economy of flood adaptation. Um, we've had work developing a theoretical framework for thinking about how climate change impacts local government fiscal stress. Um, we've had a national analysis looking at how the housing market is underpricing flood risk. We've had work looking at how the likelihood of, of successive hurricanes changes under um, climate change and a number of other things. These are these are just the ones with press releases that I could grab nice nice pictures from. Um, so that's what we're trying to do at Rutgers, right? So taking the land grant spirit. Uh, of bringing people together to solve, to understand and solve problems, recognizing that doing that effectively requires really treating the people whose skill is the bringing people together as an important part and arguably the most important part of the process. Uh, and certainly something that, that needs to be invested in as an institutional resource if we want to do this work. Um, and trying to use that to help people make better decisions while advancing the science of climate risk. So that's sort of part of what we're doing. And then meanwhile, right, has a has a university that prioritizes climate change. It's also important that we actually, you know, look at how we put our own house in order. Um, and so that's what led us, uh, you know, we were a little slow to the game, but in 20, uh, 21, we adopted our first university climate action plan. So I want to tell you briefly a little bit about that um, and then wrap up. Uh, so the story of our climate action plan sort of starts in 2019. And one of the driving factors there uh, was the students. Um, you know, 2019, some of you may recall, was a time when there were climate strikes um, all around the world. Um, and, you know, of uh, you know, and, and, and at Rutgers, uh, you know, the, the, the student climate strike, which also involved faculty and staff, um, you know, had a few demands, uh, which included fossil fuel divestment, developing a climate action plan, establishing an office to oversee that climate action plan, and setting a target date uh, for the university to be, to be carbon neutral. Um, so uh, President Barchi asked, me and Kevin Lyons, who's a professor at the business school who works on supply chain sustainability, um, to co-chair a task force to develop record strategies for both carbon neutrality. Uh, so how do we contribute? And in we case, uh, we, we early on decided, right, we're going to keep the focus not just on our own university, but on the university in service of, of the world and service of the climate crisis. So we define carbon neutrality as contributing to achieving global net zero carbon dioxide emissions, not simply net zero on our own campus, and climate resilience. So it's advancing the capacity of the university in the state of New Jersey to manage the risks of climate change, while also advancing climate positive, equitable economic development in New Jersey. So you can see in this charge, like some of what I was hinting to with uh, the, the um, role of the university has a catalyst for, for a broader societal climate action. Um, so this was a process that took almost two years from the establishment of the, of the task force um, until the final report. Um, and I just want to briefly uh, show you some of the key findings. So this is our um, FY29 uh, estimates of, of our contribution uh, to the climate change problem when we are in the process of getting the, the system in state so we can easily uh, keep this up to date. 
Um, and roughly, we, we contribute about 500,000 tons a year of carbon dioxide emissions, which constitutes about half a percent of all of the emissions of greenhouse gases in New Jersey. Right? So, so Rutgers is a large employer in New Jersey and a large part of our emissions problem. And if we use the current US government social cost of carbon estimates from a draft um, EPA report, um, you'd say that you know, our 500,000 tons of carbon dioxide emissions each year are causing about $100 million each year of damage uh, to global society. So that's a significant thing and we shouldn't be doing it and we have to figure out how to stop doing it. So the Climate Action Plan sets out a vision in which Rutgers is a global, comes a global leader in university climate action, you know, making our campuses more sustainable and resilient, but also measurably accelerating climate action across New Jersey and the Northeast urban mega region. That's the megalopolitan and mock also, and building a model for a large public land grant university that puts tackling the global climate crisis at its mission center and links all aspects of our activities in the service of transformative change. So what do we mean by all aspects? Well, of course, we do research and teaching and extension at Rutgers, and that's part of all aspects, but we are also a $5 billion a year um, organization uh, with a community of 100,000 people. And that's quite, a, you know, that's a, the comparable to a small to medium sized city. Uh, and so our operations are important and our role as an economic player in the state are important. And so when we talk about all aspects, we're talking about, well, how do we think about Rutgers as an academic entity, has an operational entity, and as an economic player in New Jersey? Um, and the goal of the plan is to, to mobilize all of those to advance just and equitable climate solutions and help achieve national net zero greenhouse gas emissions no later than 2050, which is the commitment that President Biden has made um, on behalf of the US um, in the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. So within that, we have our own goals. Uh, or sub goals, right? So for the university itself to become carbon neutral by 2040, for our campuses in partnership with our communities to advance just equitable climate adaptation, to work to build a culture of sustainability that integrates climate action into academics, life, and policy across our four campuses, and to do so in a manner that becomes a global model for, for climate action in our campus, local, and state communities. And from the Climate Action Plan, we see a few values that popped out of the partner. So one is climate justice. Right? We want to be cognizant as we do this uh, about addressing legacies of inequality um, and ensuring that we recognize uh, the, the, how, to, how to address concerns related to historically disadvantaged groups and minimize barriers to self determination for all our, our community members, community in both the Rutgers sense and the broader sense. Um, civic responsibility, right, which underlies a lot of that land grant stuff I was talking about before, right, the public service element, right, so be of service in all the communities to which Rutgers claims membership through internal, local, national, and global partnerships based on mutual respect and trust. And the third is actionable scholarship. Um, so we want to integrate Rutgers operational and academic straits to achieve our climate goals and use our campuses as living labs to innovate, test, and communicate climate solutions. And we also want, in the course of doing that, to, to view ourselves and how we go about climate action as an object of, of study. Right? So, so do use-inspired research on climate action and use-inspired research on how universities can best fulfill our mission as catalysts of, of um, societal climate action. I'm not going to, given the time, I'm not going to go into the details of our mitigation plan, um, but we'll briefly say, you know, we, we have a trajectory that aims at a 50% reduction of emissions by 2030 uh, with minimal reliances on offsets um, and achieving net zero emissions by 2040 with offsets used only for the purposes of offsetting things that cannot be directly in our control. So that means uh, you know, eliminating on-campus emissions of, of carbon dioxide and emissions associated with our electricity use and using offsets only for uh, residual emissions associated with things like commuting in the, in the supply chain. 
and include so so to, to ensure hold the university to account for that with uh, President Holloway created the Office of Climate Action to act as the advocate for climate action and sustainability at the highest levels of the university to provide oversight and accountability for climate action plan implementation and to catalyze that implementation where necessary and to communicate about climate action internally and externally. Um, so so those are sort of a set of things we are doing at Rutgers that align with this land grant university vision. Well, what are the barriers at Rutgers and more broadly? Well, so there are a couple main ones. So one is, you know, as I have emphasized a few times, doing use inspired research and extension well requires treating that as a profession as work, you know, as important to the university as that of a research professor or, or teaching professor. Um, and that tends not to be the case now. So even though land grant universities have extension staff who are in many cases tenure track faculty um, and Rutgers extension agent and extension specialist are tenure track lines. Most of the people doing climate extension are not in those you know, tenure track roles. Instead, they are staff members. They are often staff members supported by grants. And sometimes that means you know, they don't know from month to month what a grant is going to be paying uh, their salary. And that is not a good way of funding something that requires building and sustaining partnerships with communities for decades, right? Climate change is not going away. Solving climate change is an iterative multi-decade problem. This is a critical decade, but so are the future decades. And one of the key challenges to taking the lessons of the land grant model and really unlocking higher education as a catalyst of climate action is that there are not those sort of sustained stable support for climate extension the way there is uh, in general for it has been for 100 years for agricultural extension. Uh, the second view is the tendency to view climate engagement as an add on to the core research and teaching mission of the university. Um, some people have called it a fourth purpose for the university on top of research, teaching and service. And I think that's exactly wrong. Uh, right. If we go back to the land grant tripod, right, being engaged with the community was not an add on fourth purpose to the land grant. It is core to instruction, use inspired research and extension. Um, and one of the challenges for doing this sort of work at universities right now is that it is slow and requires building relationships and ideally requires uh, you know, that sort of extension support by professionals uh, to do that. Um, and that's not generally what traditional tenure requirements of universities been set up to do. And if you're a young faculty at a university, um, you know, what's guiding in your prioritization uh, for very good reasons is what is required to get tenure or what is required to get reappointed if you're a non-tenure track. Um, and so to unlock universities here, we really need to integrate public scholarship into the tenure process. So one of the ideas I've been talking about for a while and is in uh, that op-ed I, I linked to at the beginning is this idea of a climate grant university, right? So building on the land grant model, uh, you know, create a network of universities uh, and, and this is not simply our one universities, but you like like Cornell and, and Rutgers, like top research universities, but also HBCUs, tribal colleges and universities, um, minority serving institutions. I mean, everybody in the higher ed sector has the potential to be extremely useful here, um, but create a network of universities committed to supporting climate extension and use inspired research and working with others in the network with the goal of getting as many climate extension agents uh, in the country as we have agricultural extension agents, because that is the climate services we capacity, the basis for the climate services capacity we need. Um, we think that, you know, one of the lessons of the land grant model is the power of leveraging the federal structure of the US, which is not how most federally supported climate services, aside from not being at, at the scale of the problem, are structured right now. Right now, they are structured as multi-state regional things, which are, are, in, are sort of consortium of different universities, where in 
we're in several. But a lot of the decision making processes in this country align with state and sub state governance structures, which is one of the reasons why I think land grant has worked so well is that the land grants build a very close relationship with the various structures, the state government, county governments, municipal governments um, that, you know, that, that have the levers to, to control a lot of the problems. Um, and so, so that's, that's sort of the, the federalism element. Um, and then the second thing is there has to be stable funding, right? So a lot of extension of climate services work right now is funded grant to grant. That's different from the cooperative extension model where the people, the extension agents are funded as capacity. So they don't need to worry about what grant is gonna fund their salary next. And so they can build these relationships that can be sustained for decades. Um, and you know that is a core element to making this work. Another insight from the land-grant model, so you sort of want to get buy-in at multiple levels. So land-grant is funded, has a partnership between the federal government and states. That might not work in every state, but I think there's a lot to, of advantages to that where it has. And you know, in New Jersey, you know, we have the New Jersey Climate Change Resource Center, which I think is a, a small scale, you know, not the scale of the problem. If it were to be, it would have to be about. Uh, 20 times larger if it were to be of a land grant extension scale, uh, but a step in the in the in the right direction. Um, and so, oh, sorry, let me just turn this. And, and so, and and, and sure, um, doing useful science today to deal with the climate crisis is something that universities have, are very well equipped in many ways to do. Um, it requires learning the lessons of the land grant experience. It rec requires recognizing that the way you do useful science is by bringing people together in groups to solve problems. And that includes the people who have the problem as well as, as, well as the people who have the tools to understand it and requires constant iteration among them. It requires recognizing that doing that well is a that that convening role requires professional capacity. It's not something that can be done by me as a research faculty member without support. It requires people whose professional skills involve getting people in groups to solve problems. Um, and we know how to do this at Langrat universities, but we are not doing it at the scale needed to, to uh, uh, solve the problem. And I think that's something that I hope over the next few years, um, higher ed sector as a whole can, can come together to address um, and that we can partner uh, with federal and state governments to address. Um, in that regard, I also want to close by mentioning that just last week I was at uh, the White House for an event organized by the Office of Science and Technology Policy and the University of Washington, focused on how communities can build bridges um, uh, for to, to, to how, how camp universities can build bridges to solve climate to solve climate action problems. Um, and I was very excited by the group there, which included everybody from R1 universities to community colleges. Um, and there's so much good stuff going around this country and it needs to be scaled up because we are facing sort of a critical time period and higher ed has a lot to bring to the table. Thanks. Hey, thank you. And um, we have some time for some questions. So if we could maybe begin if you haven't had a question answered yet, um, raise your hand. See two over there. So, um, can we go first? Yeah, you. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Um, how how directly did the climate strikes in 2019 contribute to Rutgers making this climate action plan? So uh, I think. Yeah, I, I can hear. Um, good question. We have an intern in our office who is doing historical research on sustainability at Rutgers. Um, I think it, I, I, I can't, despite having been highly involved, I can't tell you that answer. So what, what um, I can say is before the climate strikes began, I and a couple of other colleagues had put to get, put a proposal on the president's table for creating a climate task force. This was not the first time this had happened. We've tried several times over the last decade. 
in this case, you know, this was a president who was in his last year at office. He had a plan on the table. Um, I think it put, you know, having that plan on a table put him in the convenient position of when there were climate strikes to say, oh, well, somebody gave me a plan for what I would do here. Um, I'm not going to be around to see, have to deal with the output of this process. So why don't we start the process? Um, so I think the answer is that it, the, the, you know, there were, there was both a, you know, internal effort, um, to get this to happen. Uh, there was a president who, uh, you know, had been asked several times before and hadn't done it before, but was now in his last year of office. Uh, and there was this push from the students. So I think it's probably the confluence of those, but, you know, what exactly was going on beyond that? I don't know. Thanks, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Um, I was wondering if you or any colleagues had done research on um, the indigenous land dispossession and genocide associated with land grant institutions, because I think it's something that's often overlooked in history and deserves more than one slide. Um, I, I think, it, it, yes, there is the Scarlet and Black project at Rutgers has done a bunch of work. That's not where I'm putting my focus because while I agree it involves more than one slide, it is not actually relevant to what I am trying to learn from the land grants, right? So that uh, that problem, uh, the, the expropriation uh, associated with the Morrill Act of 1862 does not apply, I don't believe, to how the, the, the 1890 land grants, certainly does not apply to the 1994 land grants, does not apply to the agricultural experiment stations, and does not apply to cooperative extension. So it's an important part of the history of land grants, and I would not want to talk about the history of land grants without talking about it. But I don't think we learn anything from it that is relevant to the fact that we need to invest capacity funding in uh, people who bring people together to solve problems um, in order to have have higher ed sort of serve as a as a catalyst for for community climate action. So I think it's really important to talk about when we talk about the history of the land grant model, which is why I included it in there. But I, I don't actually see it particularly as as connected to what we learn positively from the land grant model. Any more questions from someone who hasn't had a question answered yet? Okay, let's open it up for all questions. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, so I know you talked about how uh, extension is helping the communities, but you also mentioned how it's doing global work. I was wondering if you could go more into that. Um, so, so, uh, universities do global work. Um, cooperative extension has structured, I, I'm sure like individual faculty members do, but the cooperative extension is very much locally rooted. Um, so I, we can come up with lots of examples of sort of extension of uh, specific case studies. Um, you know, Rutgers has a partnership with Greece around agricultural um, sustainability, uh, for example. Uh, but it's, you know, to be honest, I, I, it's not at, it's not at the core of the land grant model in terms of how I'm talking about it, right? Because we don't have in general extension agents placed outside the counties in our state, right? What's distinctive about the land grant model is this rootedness in community and the fact that the people rooted in community are connected to global networks, right? So, you know, I chat frequently with colleagues in other countries. I'm not an extension agent, but also, you know, that's something university faculty do. So that's what science does. Science is a global network. Um, and so I think that that is, you know, when I talk about that as a core element of what we why universities are skilled, it's the fact that inherently science and academia are global systems and global networks. And we, you know, the science does not particularly no national boundaries. Um, so, so, so it's that global connectivity, right? The idea of universities has having roots in their community, but connective networks, uh, uh, connective networks that are around the world reflected in who we collaborate with it is what I was pointing to there. Go ahead. Um, so about the climate grant universities, 
is the creation of those already happening or is it just a concept right now? So, so that's okay. And is it, is it, is there a funded network? Uh, not right. No, not right now. Um, it is something that, you know, in some form, uh, you know, I think there was a lot of excitement at this White House meeting last night of trying to figure out how would we build a national climate extension network, but, but that's just, you know, it is still, still discussion. And another sense, uh, there are, you know, without that capacity funding, which is so important, there are people at universities all around the country who are doing climate extension work and are doing use inspired climate research. And so, right, I mean, so, so, so the, a lot of the pieces are, are there. Uh, but what's not there is stable funding to actually maintain climate extension in every state. So just to uh, circle back to uh, native dispossession, I was wondering would that would uh, not uh, covering those types of topics not fall under equitable adaptation, considering yeah. uh, considering like for at least. For much of our land was uh, is actually in scrip in Washington, which was then deforested, and then the yeah. land was sold. We kept the mineral rights, and from a society of people who have already lived in a carbon neutral way for tens of thousands of years. Um, so uh, yeah, no, I, I well, a lot of uh, there there is a lot of work going on in states uh, like Washington State uh, at the state university and at tribe and at tribal colleges and universities. Um, around that, like that's a you know where you know it's not something that is a big focus in New Jersey. Uh, we do have you know we because because most of our climate problems are not you know there are our, our indigenous population remaining indigenous population is quite small. Uh, we do work, have people at the university work with them, but at states where there is large um, indigenous populations like Washington, there um, that sort of tribal adaptation is absolutely an important one of what climate services and climate extension type work that's going on. Um, and, you know, I, I personally think that for those people, for those of us in states where there's not a large indigenous population, I think you have to, to find other ways to address that historical inequity uh, than simply working with, you know, the relatively small populations um, that remain, work with them all, but you need that, but that's, there's just not enough uh, remaining in the state for that to be a, adequate way of addressing that historical inequity. We have another question. Okay, one more here, please. Yeah. I was wondering if the climate grant universities were trying to create these new universities in order to have this focus on climate change or is it to more integrate it in existing universities? Yeah, so just like, just. Uh, I, I would say the, the latter, right? I mean, we have we have plenty of universities. What we are lacking is centering of addressing the climate crisis as part of the university mission in a way that is reflected by university funding and university policies that allow this sort of extension work to be done at scale. Uh, so, absolutely, you would not. It would not make sense. You know, there, there is no time. To build new universities, I'm not sure there would be a lot of value in it. But you know, if you take as a premise that this is a critical decade, you've got to work with the pieces we have. Those pieces we have are there. There are people that you know. There are you could easily get a climate extension network built up because there are a lot of people who already do that world work in with in precariously funded positions. Um, it's just not a very good way. You know, precarious funding is not a very good way of doing this work, and so. Um, you know, having university, you know, providing a network and incentives to to really center climate addressing the climate crisis has part of the university mission. Providing that the the handshake from the federal and state governments um, and the funding uh, to make that a reality, like that that I think is what what is core to the sort of climate grant vision there. Well, let's come. Um,